Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Transformation Triumph Summit. My name is Jamie Allen Bishop, one of your hosts for this event. I am so honored and excited to introduce these authors with their special wisdom and insights to share. I imagine that you're here because one of the topics appealed to you, or perhaps you're on a transformation journey of your own. I welcome you to enjoy, listen, observe, and take away some of the insights that these authors are sharing so that you can streamline your transformation triumphs. And now, here's more about each of our authors. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, today we are paying tribute to our speaker, uh, 44-year-old Jacqueline Kane, who died in August of this year, just before finishing the retreat. She is an author for our book, Transformation Triumphs. She is going to be in the book. So her, her final words um, that she wrote are going to be in there. And that is how we're going to pay tribute to her uh, as a speaker today is by reading her chapter to you. So bear with me if I cry. Um, she was a, she's been a dear supporter of ours for the last two and a half, three years. And just what a shock. So deep breaths, Jamie. <laughs> okay. Jacqueline Kane, a master certified health coach and certified trauma informed coach, dedicated her life to dispelling the stigma surrounding trauma as a mental disorder, recognizing its profound impact on recovery. A survival, a survivor of child abuse, 9-11, domestic abuse, and breast cancer, Jacqueline connected deeply from the Dr. Sears Wellness Institute. Hailing from, sorry, I skipped a line. My apologies. Jacqueline connected deeply with fellow survivors, fostering empathy and healing. In 2021, she earned her diploma from the Dr. Sears Wellness Institute. That makes a lot more sense, right? <laughs> Hailing from central New Jersey, near the Jersey Shore, she settled in South Florida alongside her loyal companion, Cooper, her puppy dog. Jacqueline's earthly journey ended in August 2023, but she continues to shine on through her legacy. We will um, drop her obituary in the chat as soon as I'm done reading her chapter. Her chapter does not have a title. Uh, we're contemplating giving it the title of a tribute to Jacqueline Kane. If any of you in attendance today have a better idea, please share it in the chat because we are open to sharing that with the publisher. <clears throat> All right. So many people ask me why health and wellness has become such an important part of my life. Well, if you have a little time, I'll tell you my story. I'm a Jersey girl through and through. I grew up in central New Jersey by the Jersey Shore. I went to schools in the Middletown, New Jersey school district and graduated from Middletown South. The plan was to go to communi community college However, I soon realized it wasn't for me. I wanted to be making money. I had been working since I was about 14, but my first real full-time job was in Belmar at the ticket broker's office. We sold tickets for Broadway shows, concerts, and all sorts of events. It was a small office and I made wonderful friends I still keep in touch with to this day. Though I worked there for a while and made pretty good money, I knew this wasn't a lifelong career. I would have to look to New York City for something, but I wasn't sure what that was. At the time, there were still industries where you could work your way up the ladder, even without a college degree. A headhunter set me up with a, several interviews at brokerage houses most of which didn't even exist anymore. I'm sorry, most of which don't even exist anymore. 
After several weeks of going into the city to interview, in the summer of 2000, I landed a position at Aon Financial Services Group, located at the number two World Trade Center. I wanted to shout, look at me, I'm 20 years old, and I work at that building on, 100th, on the 100th floor. At Aon, I made decent money, but even better, I made some best friends, the closest whom was Michelle Reed. Michelle and I always had a blast. We were inseparable at work and even signed up for a gym membership at Lucille Roberts, where we took cardio kickboxing every day during lunch. In our free time, we did a couple of things with our boyfriends. We really built a beautiful relationship. Even my commute to Manhattan turned out to be fun. Each morning, I would take the New Jersey Transit from Red Bank to Newark and switch to the PATH train that would take me directly into the World Trade Center. One morning, I ran into Dave, an old high school friend who was also working downtown. Dave and I had so much fun laughing and doing stupid things on our commute that time flew by and we would be in the city before we knew it. On September 11th, 2001, I woke up to a perfect day with sun shining bright and cool fall weather. I put on my black V-neck sweater, khaki pants, and black platform shoes as I was leaving the house. My mom said something she had never said before. You look really nice today. Little did I know it was an outfit I would remember forever. Dave and I met on the PATH train to our daily commute. As usual, we were laughing and not paying much attention. But at some point, we started to notice that a lot of people were exiting the train at stops in Jersey City. This was odd, as the World Trade Center was the last stop and everyone got off there like a herd of cattle. We dismissed it at the time. And when we pulled into the World Trade Center, we smelled smoke. We just thought it was, I don't know, track fire, as that happened often with newspapers and things like that. When we exited the train, we walked up the escalators to go into the mall inside the World Trade Center. And we noticed that the escalators were pretty empty for a Tuesday morning. When we reached the top of the escalator, I said, later, loser. And Dave and I parted ways to go to our offices. After taking a few steps toward the second World Trade Center tower, I noticed that the entrance was blocked off by the fire department, New York Fire Department and New York Police Department. Something clearly isn't right. I turned around, saw Dave, and started screaming for him to wait for me. Finally, he heard me and stopped to wait. That was when everything changed. Dave and I saw the fear in everyone's eyes. We were walking over body parts and seeing things falling from the sky. We didn't know what it was going on. We didn't know what was going on. And we were ushered across the street by the New York Police Department and Fire Departments. So we would be safe from whatever was going on. We stood on the corner and looked up as everyone was. People were chattering in the background. It was an accident. A helicopter accidentally flew into a building. How horrible of an accident is this? We stood there and watched people desperately trying to scale down the World Trade Center from the upper floors. No one made it. All I could think was that everyone from my building must surely be evacuating down the stairs and that they'd be safe. And that is when it happened. I heard a swoosh and boom. When I looked up, I saw that American Flight 175 had crashed into my building. We stood and everything was silent. Everything was happening in slow motion. For whatever reason, some man pulled me into a phone booth with him to protect me from the glass and debris falling from the sky. And protect me, he did. 
right there, I was standing, right where I was standing, part of the plane's wing landed and I, and it could have cut off my legs or worse. Chaos ensued and Dave and I got split up in the crowds running for their lives. The thoughts in my head were so elementary, must run, must go, must get far. This building is going to collapse. I don't wanna be here. I ran in those high platform shoes to the Blarney Stone on uh, a bar on 34th Street in about 45 minutes. Crazy what adrenaline will do to you. I walked in and found that area, that an area of the bar was, it was packed. Ordered a shot of Jameson and proceeded to watch my building collapse on TV. Now, all I could think about was Michelle. Had she made it out? Where was she? Why wasn't she answering her cell phone? Why was it going to voicemail? New York City went on lockdown with all forms of transportation into and out of the city at a standstill. The tunnels were closed, but I had made some friends that day and we stuck together. I called my mom several times during the day for updates and about four o'clock, she finally said that the ferries were running and to get over to the east side and catch one. My feet were raw and blistered but I determined, but I was determined to get out. Once over there, I caught one of the last ferries leaving. I finally made it home and had an emotional reunion with my family, but still nothing about Michelle. A few days went by and my department had a conference call where they would say people's names to see if they were okay. To hear the dead air when many names were called was heartbreaking. Michelle was one of those names. Determined to find out something about her, my boyfriend and I started going to the Red Cross tents in the city almost every day. I can still smell the smells of toxins burning out of the World Trade Center site. It was a smell I will never forget. After several weeks, we gave up and hoped that some DNA would match hers and we could have some closure. But Michelle was never found. My company lost 178 people that day. Most were never recovered. I pray for them all, all the time. Life eventually went on, but it was different now. I suffered from extreme anxiety and PTSD and still do. The nightmares and flashbacks were part of a daily life experience, but I trudged through the days, the minutes, and sometimes even seconds. This became my new normal. And though I don't come as often, and though they don't come as often anymore, I still live with these scars daily, but I survived, right? Not so fast. Flash forward to March, 2017. I was now living in Bergen County, New Jersey with a few girls. One morning I was in the shower and felt a lump in my breast. I, it felt really big, but I thought nothing about it. A couple days later, I felt it again and I had my roommate feel it. She felt it too. And that's when I became alarmed. I called my mom who said it was probably a cyst Breast cancer doesn't run in our family. But that Monday, I made an appointment with my doctor who told me to go in, have a mammogram to get it checked out. She seemed concerned. So I went directly to the breast cancer of Holy Name Hospital and waited until they could get me in. Several hours later, I finally was called back. After the test nurse came in and said to the doc, the doctor needed to speak to me. That's never a good sign. <laughs> and I was all by myself looking up at those stupid clouds they have on the ceiling. How is that calming? Anyway, he came in and said that it looked suspicious and he wanted to order a biopsy. That week went so fast. And on March 17th, 
I got the call to come to the hospital and was told that I had an aggressive breast cancer. I needed to see an oncologist ASAP. I was like, WTF? I survived 9-11. Now this? Treatment started about two weeks after I saw the oncologist. My tumor was five and a half centimeters or almost two inches, which is big. I would have the chemotherapy, a bilateral mastectomy and radiation. We all have come to realize that this was a 9-11 cancer. I tested negative for the BRCA gene. From all the toxins I had breathed in that day and the days following, after, I was going back to, oh, I, and all the days after when I was going back to search for Michelle, they didn't get me in 2001, but it sure came to bite me in the ass several years later. During chemo, they were giving me steroids to keep my weight up, and it sure did, to the tune of 50 pounds. I'm not a big person, so this was a lot on my frame. When I was finally cleared to start exercising again, I started to look into science-based diets that would help me lose weight and hopefully keep the cancer from coming back. I basically started to coach myself, writing affirmations, hiring a personal trainer, and staying motivated. The pounds came off pretty quickly and stayed off. I was probably in the best shape of my life. Since I had done this to myself, I started looking into, since I had done this myself, I started to look into a career in health coaching. If I could do it, certainly others could do it with motivation and accountability. I started my education at Dr. Sears Wellness Institute in 2001 and became a certified coach. After that, I decided to take the master certified health coach course and I'm now sitting for the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches this year. Given my history of trauma, in addition to 9-11 and breast cancer, I also survived child abuse and domestic violence. I felt called to practice trauma-informed coaching arena. My goal is to help people cope with their trauma using techniques to guide them to live their best lives in the present day. Trauma is not the disorder, but an adaptation, and we can live full lives every day, thriving one day at a time. 